Good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of the organizers of the National Science Day program at Bose Institute, I welcome all of you to this program. Today, we have with us Professor Somitra Shengupta from Indian Association of Cultivation of Science, who will deliver a lecture on the theme of this year's National Science Day program which is the future of science, technology, and innovation, the impact on education skills. So in the beginning, I would request Professor Tapan Kumar Dutta, the Dean R&D at Bose Institute, to welcome all of you and inaugurate the program. Tapan Dutta, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I warmly welcome you all on behalf of Bose Institute on this auspicious occasion to celebrate National Science Day. Well, by celebrating National Science Day, we all know that we show our dignity and respect to one of the famous physicists, Sir C. V. Raman, for his famous discovery of Raman's effect. But in today's context, apart from that, we also celebrate National Science Day to popularize the values on the importance of science used in the daily life of the people. And for each year, Science Day, National Science Day theme is different, which is very much relevant and contextual. Like last year, it was women in science. And this year's uh, theme is future of science, technology, and innovations, impacts on education, skills, and work. In fact, this year's theme has emerged from the hardship we have been going through or facing still since the outbreak of COVID-19. And with a view to march ahead on a sustainable development for achieving an Atmanirbhar Bharat. And that too by emphasizing the need by contributing greatly in the field of science, developing technologies and encouraging grassroots innovations. Well, so it is the responsibility to all of us and especially to the students, the young mind, to come forward with determination and take those challenges to make India prosper in science and technology. So once again, I welcome all of you and wish all science enthusiasts the very the best and enhance their scientific team. Thank you. Thank you, Tapanda. I would now I'd like to request Professor Sanjay Kumar Ghosh to introduce today's speaker. Sanjay Dapri. Good afternoon, everyone. Gravitational wave is an invisible yet incredibly fast ripple in space. Detecting and analyzing the information carried by gravitational waves allow us to observe the universe in a way never before possible. It provides all of us 
a glimpse of literally unseeable wonders. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Professor Shomitra Sengupto, who will tell us about the fascinating physics of gravitational waves. Professor Sengupto, a well-respected physicist with research interest in the areas of supergravity, cosmology, and black holes, among others, is also universally acknowledged as a great teacher of our time. Professor Shengupto, affectionately known as Akuda to his students, did his PhD from Shahai Institute of Nuclear Physics. He was a faculty in Presidency College during 93 to 96 and Jadupur University during 96 to 2002. Presently, he is a senior professor and dean at Indian, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. Professor Shengupto, a fellow of National Academy of Sciences, has written many well appreciated papers in the related areas contributing significantly to our understanding. So without much further ado, let me welcome Professor Shengupto, Shomitra Shengupto to deliver 2021 National Science Day le Lecture on Gravitational Wave, a new era of communication. <laughs> Professor Shengupto. OK, so let me just share my screen. Um, just a minute. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes, it's coming. Can you can you see the screen? Yeah. Now? We can see now. But I'll, I'll make it full. Uh, Full screen now? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. So, okay. So I sincerely thank the, all the members of Bosch Institute who have invited me here, particularly Simonti, who called me uh, to give this talk. And um, of course, in the context of today's talk, uh, you will see that uh, the you know the name after whom this institute namely the Jesse Bosch, who has such an important role to play in the process of communication. And I will refer, I will mention that in my talk. Uh, so I think this is probably the best institute to talk about uh, this kind of topic. This topic is particularly important for two reasons. One is that uh, the, after this path-breaking discovery, uh, India has is now coming up with a gravitational wave detector which should operate and it is being built up in Maharashtra and we will talk about this later again and of course it is go going to open a completely new horizon in the context of Indian science. In our, my group here, in our gravity research group, we have some collaboration with some important members who are now working in LIGO USA. And we have come up with some of the theoretical work. So the objective of this work is just to communicate that why, why uh, you know, this particular discovery is considered very special. Among many other important discoveries, this discovery is definitely considered to be one of the path-breaking discovery in recent years. So let me try to uh, first tell you about the background of this entire work, uh, the gravitational wave and a new era of communication. So magical moments in 14th September 2015, for the first time we heard the musical voice of the cosmos. And then again on 26 December 2015, and then again several times. And the statement is that we have finally detected gravitational wave. In physics was awarded in 2017 after two years to these three gentlemen, Reiner Weiss, Betty Barish, and Keith Thorne from MIT, Caltech, and Princeton. And they are, of course, you know, all of you know about them, and they were behind this very big discovery. 
actually begins with Einstein. We know that our universe started, the origin of the universe is from a huge explosion called Big Bang, when a huge amount of energy was released with ever expanding space and time. And we are kind of sitting somewhere in this very big universe. We started from a point with a Big Bang, huge explosion. And the universe from a point started growing with a very high temperature because the energy was very high. And then as it grew larger and larger, energy decreased. And finally, we are here. And the enormous you know, heat wave generated now got diluted only at 3 degree Kelvin all across the universe called, called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And from that inner on some of the particles, then atoms, then ions, then gradually molecules, and then dust, gases, and then stars, planets, and everything. And here we are. So gradually, it, the various things form from the energy that was released at the time of the Big Bang. Now, this is another way to show that in terms of time, when what happened, you can see very rapidly, quickly, from the first few seconds, First few minutes, maybe a lot of things happened. <coughs> then universe kept on expanding since then. Now, just to give you an idea, let's see whose si size is roughly this. It's a you know, light year means the distance traveled by light in one year, which is absurdly large. And this is roughly the size of the galaxy with 100 billion stars, which are each such galaxies. And so far, we have detected 100 billion such galaxies and distance between two galaxies approximately 10 to the power 20 kilometers. That would give you a size, rough estimate of the universe that we are not even a point in the universe. But then, of course, the question comes about see, this such a big universe, so many stars, so many planets, so many things happening. As I was describing, how do you know this? So, how do you get information and receive information to or from one place to another? So this is such an important because we are, you know, in science, we are constantly getting information from one place to another. We are measuring something that is also extracting information. We are sending something. So how do you do this? That is, the question is, even now when I'm talking to you, we are communicating. So how do you communicate from one point in space to another point in space? This is actually behind everything. So when you see a star, how do you are you are extracting information? When you are seeing something else, something uh, you are somebody walking on the street, even you are extracting an information. So how the information is tra uh, traveled from one point to another? In other words, how do we communicate? The answer to this very simply by one sentence is by electric and magnetic field. As simple as that. It is because. In nature, we know that there are two important forces, main forces, which you observe. One is the force, and, and of course, Newton said force is mass into acceleration. The force is thing because then only something can accelerate and do some interesting things. Otherwise, the thing in static will forever remain in static. So, force is the most crucial thing. And there are two important forces of nature. One is electromagnetism and other is gravitation. Now, electromagnetism is a force which you are encountering all the time. Suppose you are pushing something by your hand. So the electrons, the charged particle inside the atoms in your hand, they are coming close to the charged particle. Suppose you are pushing some books on the table. The, that also comprises of atoms and it has electric charges. So they come close and they repel each other. So push, pull, hit. Everything that you do is electromagnetic force. It is a force between the electric charges of your hand or the electric charges of the object. So electromagnetism is all around everywhere. And it is because of electric charges. But on the other hand, there is another force, very important force, namely gravitation. This force is also, these, both these forces are very long range. They spread over a long distance. And the force of gravitation <coughs> you know, is very different from electricity magnetism. It is a force where one mass attracts another mass by some force. And the force for which the planet is moving around the sun because 
because of the rem we all know this and these two forces are the two main forces the other two nuclear forces which happen at a very small scale are not the, uh, our point of discussion today these are the two main forces which govern our life in a big way so you can imagine if either of these two forces were not there nothing will exist in the universe so these two forces are critically important energy force so the first one the pioneers we all know were coulomb faraday maxwell you have heard the name of all the great scientists who taught us about the electric and magnetic forces and what they taught is the following that from our school days that if you positive charge negative charge they attract there is a lines of force they attract two positive to like charge repels and everything so these two charges at rest they exert electrostatic force or electric force on each other but interestingly then these people showed that if that electric charge starts moving suppose this starts moving in a direction v and moving electric charge is current so if there is an electric current that the charge moves it produces that i talked talked in the previous slide on each other apart from that it produces a new field called magnetic field surrounding it so magnetic field comes the origin is same the electric charge but because of its motion if the velocity is zero then there will be no magnetic field only electric field but if the velocity is non zero there will be magnetic field also along with the electric field charge current produces magnetic field and we all know this from our school days then the question comes if the velocity of the charge is accelerating so this electric field and magnetic field are described by all of you know coulomb's law and faraday's law and they are combined as maxwell's laws of electricity magnetism but then this law also shows that when the electric charges accelerates that is the velocity with which they are moving is changing so it's an accelerating motion then the electric and magnetic field that was there around it they are exerting force the field starts to travel in space it is something like it is something like the waves on our sea the field the, the the field is you know the measure of the force that the value actually starts moving in space so it was there now it, after some time at a long distance it will start exerting force and the electric and magnetic field starts spreading like a wave electro magnetic wave and all of you know from a school day this is the standard wave it finds the oscillation of the of anything so it is moving say in one dimension in along x and this is oscillating in time and the wave tells you that the coefficient of this term del to phi del t square is the 1 by v square this v is the velocity of the wave so this is the standard wave equation that we learned in our early college days where phi is is any any disturbance anything now for maxwell's laws if you do a little bit of algebra you will find that the electric and magnetic field satisfy these equations and which immediately tells you that if you compare with this that the velocity of this electric and magnetic field with which they move is the speed of light c magnetic wave therefore when the electric charges accelerate the electric and magnetic field moves like a wave with speed speed of light that electric and magnetic field are basically they travel with speed v equal to c where c is the speed of light so what is electromagnetic wave it is the oscillating electric and magnetic field traveling through space with speed of light in vacuum and they they spread all across the universe and the origin is the accelerating charge so this is typically see this electric so it, interestingly the electric field and magnetic field they oscillate in the perpendicular direction and the wave moves in this direction so it is this called transverse wave because the oscillations is in xy plane plane uh, this e and this is b and this is the direction of motion you can see that this is this is this is a one motion by oscillation there another oscillation and this is the direction of motion this i have showed here okay so this is the electromagnetic wave and for example light ray x ray gamma ray everything they are electromagnetic waves of different frequencies the frequencies are different how they oscillate they are different but they all travel in space in vacuum with speed of light which is very large speed and this is our mode of communication in the modern world 
This is the way we communicate in our modern world. Everything. When you see a star in the sky, actually the light or electromagnetic wave is coming towards you to bring that information. Whatever you observe in telescope, you through, do through electromagnetic waves. You see something in your room, something on the street, something on the, you know, you are seeing television. The camera is, uh, you know, the, the capturing the, uh, the game on the cricket ground and it is sending it to the satellite through electromagnetic wave. That electromagnetic wave comes to Indian satellite. That is, that comes to your television. All are transmission of electromagnetic wave. You are talking in mobile phone. It is traveling through electromagnetic wave. So, entire mode based on only one thing is the electromagnetic wave. So, this is the wireless communication. So, basically, you make electric charge or accelerating, and then it emits wave with appropriate frequency, and you receive in another part. So, that's where you we talk in mobile and see do everything. Now. We most unfortunately forget that such a path-breaking discovery, just this is an unimaginable discovery, was done in this city by Sajjah Sibos. And we know now that most unfortunately he was not given the due recognition initially, but subsequently it was given. And he did some unbelievable work for which, for which the modern world is surviving. He first made this wireless communication from the University Institute Hall to Presidency College Laboratory. Now, I, I, I always think that we should remember that this such a, I, I, do, I don't know how many discoveries in science can be compared to this, and, but, and this was done in our city. Of course, by this all time great scientist of the world. Communication originated from electromagnetic force. All of you know, agree that this is the electric and magnetic field and their oscillation because of accelerating charge. This is the order of communication. Therefore, a vital question. Now, we have only one more force because nuclear forces are very short range force. They cannot propagate, they cannot travel. Only other force is gravitational force. I talked in the initially. Does gravitational field also travel like a wave with a finite speed, like what is happening in electromagnetic case? And so can it be another possible mode of communication? You agree that this is a natural, inevitable question. So I shift to the next slide. It is Newton and force of gravitation, because we have to first understand what is force of gravitation? So to understand, let me tell you once again, Sir Isaac Newton taught us about gravity. All of you have heard about this falling apple story, where he was asking the question why apple fell from the tree. I don't know whether the story is true or not, but it is important. Of course, Newton, probably the greatest of the greats. He did so many things. He taught us the language of modern science. He could recognize that the same force which is pulling the apple from the tree is responsible for the motion of the planet around the sun. It's a force between the two masses. And he wrote the famous law of gravitation that two masses, M and M, separated by the distance x. The force between them is given by this, the product of the two masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And this is a proportionality constant called Newton's constant or universal gravitational constant. And you have to remember that he also pointed out that this value of this g is so small, it is a very small number, that unless the, either of the two masses or both the masses are large, then gravity cannot be so easily detected. For this reason, say two books now lying on your table, they are attracting each other by this force, but they are two books are not hitting each other. You two are sitting side by side in two chairs, you are not colliding onto each other. The force is actually so small that that force cannot overcome the frictional force on the table, which is an electromagnetic force. But if one of the masses is very high, say our Earth or Sun or planet, then of course, force of gravity is a very important force. 
and it governs everything. According to Newton, the speed of propagation of gravitational effect is infinity. According to Newton, the speed of propagation of gravitational effect is infinity. Why? He said that if you move this mass slightly, the distance changes and immediately this mass knows that it has moved because the force changes. So he said that this, this force is communicated, this, this its motion, that this force changes 1 by x squared, this x changes, immediately this mass recognizes, therefore it is immediately transmitted through them. So the speed of propagation of gravitational effect is infinite, it propagates instantaneously. So if the something happens in sun, we know on earth, according to Newton, instantly on the same instant. Moves gravitational field at a distant point changes instantaneously, as I say. That means the effect is traveling with infinite speed. It is doing, so suppose I do something here, you know, at that instant, that means but the effect is traveling with infinite speed and it's not taking any time. Einstein, we all know, questioned the Newtonian view about space and time. What he said, it's not everybody as we think that our time, your time, time on the, in the sun, time in the planet, time in the, some other point, time in England, time in USA. He said, time is also relative from one observer to another, just our, we, our positions are relative. Somebody is nearer to me, somebody is far, far, to me, far from me. Time is also a very relative concept. So he showed, he showed that time flows different for different observer, say some object A and object B. So suppose somebody is not moving whose time is flowing at a rate T0, say T0 is one second. Somebody is moving with velocity V his time will be this. In other words, this quantity being a fraction because some, something is subtracted from one square root, something is a fraction. This makes t greater than t0 because you divide something by a fraction, it becomes larger. So one second becomes larger. So the moving clock, which moves with velocity v, it runs slowly because its time is enlarged. So it is running more slowly and therefore the same time in one clock is appeared to be much larger time. That is, it's slowing down. And in fact, at v equal to c, at v equal to c, it becomes zero in the denominator. It becomes infinite. That is, clock has stopped almost because the time is not flowing. He's one second, he's becoming infinite time that his clock is not moving. So he said the flow of time actually is a question of how fast you are moving. This is an absolute tremendous discovery, you know, the subject is called special theory of relativity. And he then showed also that the mass, what we think to be constant, is also changing with velocity. Something as mass m0. In when it is at rest, when it is moving with velocity v, its mass becomes this. So again, m is greater than m0. Mass changes, mass changes quickly. Mass changes with speed. So, work done by a force partly goes into increasing the kinetic energy of the body. As Newtonian mechanics think that when you do work, it increases the kinetic energy. But Einstein showed yes, but also it goes to increasing the mass of the body. If you do work, as speed increases, mass also increases. So, he then showed that work or energy and mass are interrelated. One is causing the other to increase. So, there has to be a relation between them. Work done or energy is converted into mass. So mass is also convertible into energy. Energy and mass are interconvertible. And he wrote the famous equation e equal to c squared. The small mass, you can get a huge energy because c is very large. And for a huge energy divided by c squared, you can create small masses. So when you know that we create new particles in the accelerators, you know, the large hadron collider, to be hitting each other, creating new particles, Higgs particles, all are basically this equation where you are creating new particles from energy. Similarly, mass is converted into energy. We know all about Hiroshima and Nagasaki destruction, the mass converted into energy. So we know about this. And the destruction, particle destroyed, energy released, 
and object colliding from huge energy, new masses, new particles are created. The question is, this is all fine, but one, there's one important thing I'd like to mention. V cannot be greater than C because if V is greater than C, then see this happens, Einstein's original formulation, that this quantity becomes negative because one minus V square by C square, V greater than C means is negative. And this to the power half P square root, square root of a negative number is imaginary number. Time cannot be imaginary. Time can slow down, but it cannot be imaginary. So, so, included than speed is our limit it is our limit you cannot cross the speed of light and if you reach the speed of light your mass becomes see your mass be see mass becomes infinity again because this is by zero and mass becomes infinity means you cannot travel at the, you cannot accelerate further so your speed of light is your kind of is a, is a bounce it's a sensor on you but Newton said gravitational effect propagates in, with infinite speed. Just now I showed you Newton's law. So there is a contradiction. This contradicts Einstein relativity that in vacuum, no information can travel with speed faster than light. This is relativity. And Newton says that gravity travels with infinite speed. So something is wrong in Newtonian description of gravity if we believe the relativity is correct. So what we do? Go back to Einstein again, who came up with a beautiful, which is known as general theory. Einstein the concept of attractive gravitational force between two objects, as Newton thought, that two objects, I wrote GMM by R square, X squared. That force law he rejected. He came out with a brilliant idea. He said that suppose when we are studying in our high school, we saw that triangles have three angles, sum equal to 180 degrees. We all studied, we know that Pythagoras theorem c squared equal to a squared plus b squared is size of the hypotenuse square. Sort of one, in thought is distance between two points is a straight line. We know the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. This all we studied in our school days. He said this is true only for flat like surface like Euclid. Top surface, suppose surface of a football surface of a football, the triangle, the sum of the three angles is greater than 180. This is flat, this is equal to 180, and this is again curved, this is less than, so this is a concave surface, this is less than 180, this is convex surface, this is greater than 180. So Einstein said that Newton thought that body travel along a straight line in our space, which is flat, in absence of force, and accelerates with curved line, a body is accelerating, changing direction, curve line. This is first law of Newton. We all studied in our school days that it accelerates when there is force and travels in curve line. Einstein said that C travel no plan when this is attracting this object, attracting this. So it is traveling in a curve line, and you are saying it is accelerating because the path is curve line. Curve path means acceleration, changing the direction of the velocity. But Einstein said, this object does not attract anybody. There is no force of attraction as Newton thought. He said, it bends the space. And in a curved space like the surface of a football, everything is bound to travel in a curved path. It has no choice. The, the entire space-time fabric is curved. So on the surface of a football, just there is no straight line. You can go from one point to another. There is no straight line is defined. So, <coughs> excuse me, the mass bends the space-time. As a result, it travels along the curve line. Travel along the curve line. It is not attracting. It is not attracting anything. It is, it is curved the space. So presence of mass energy curves the space-time, changing the geometry. The shortest distance is now a curved line because, you know, there is no straight line on the surface of a football, giving an illusion of acceleration because now it's traveling because, but because of the space-time has changed. 
due to the existence. So we have an illusion that since it is acceleration, and therefore there is a force. The Newton taught us about force and acceleration connected, and showed us acceleration and geometry connected. So force he replaced by geometry. So illusion of force originates from curved geometry. So there is nothing called gravitational force. It's a manifestation of space-time geometry. Now, just to make it little more for you, it is, you know, C squared is A squared plus B squared. All of you have studied Pythagoras theorem. But do you know that this is true only for a flat, flat notebook where you draw your triangle, flat notebook. But if you do it on a curved surface, the sum of the C squared is not equal to A squared plus B squared. It is absolutely not. It is C squared is equal to 1 into A squared plus 1 into B squared. No, it is 1 plus some function of the coordinate of the space A squared plus 1 plus some function which is the coordinate of the space squared. Do you know this is the definition of curved geometry that the distance Pythagoras theorem is modified by a functions F1 and F2. So if you now if you now change it to three dimension, say x, y, z, and x plus the distance between two points, now by same Pythagoras theorem in three dimension, for flat space it is one dx square, one dy square, one dz square. Just this this minus this whole square plus this minus this whole square. You all learn Cartesian coordinate geometry, but this fails for curved geometry. It is some one plus f one dx square plus one plus f two dx square plus one plus f three. This one this one coefficient of dx square, dy square, dz square is modified by some functions and these functions are called the metric of the space. So the metric of the space determines these functions whether the space is flat or the space is curved. Of course Einstein taught us that time is also different. So time is like a coordinate as we heard know about space. So he defined the distance in fourth dimension 1 plus f1 dx square, 1 plus f2 dy square, 1 plus f3 dz square, and it should have been 1 plus f4 dt square, but we have put a constant here just so that the unit of this quantity and unit of c time and ay has different unit, but you multiply it by some constant velocity, then distance square by time square, this time square cancels, all have same unit. So this is c square dt square. Here it appears, and this minus sign tells you that though time is something like a coordinate different from everybody. But there is one difference between space and time. In space, you can travel in both the directions, but in time, only in one direction. That is either to future, we are traveling all towards future. You cannot, if you wish you want to go back, you can, cannot go back to past. Minus sign, which if time I will explain later, it tells you that unlike X, Y, Z, time has this character that it can travel only in one direction. So this is the four dimensional distance like thing, Pythagoras, four dimensional Pythagoras, with this function determines this curvature of the space. Now from this metric, that is named this F1, F2, F3, F4, the famous mathematician Riemann, Riemann, he showed that you can define some quantities. This, you do not have to go the details of this, but remember, this measures how the space is curved. This is called curvatures. These are called, this is F1, F2, F3, F4, if they are zero, if they are zero, I'm sorry, if they are zero, then this becomes one dx square one, just as usual flat space, usual flat space, then the curvature also becomes zero. So if all metric modifications are zero, the curvature is also equal to zero. So he defines quantities, the curvature from the background metric f1, f2, f3, f4. So then Einstein wrote a famous equation, which I've written in a slightly symbolic way because it's actual equation looks a bit complicated. But this tells you the essence that one side you have curvature, the other side you have mass. Mass non-zero means curvature non-zero. So mass energy curves the space-time, as I said. And particle now travels in a curved line and we are thinking that there is a force. There is no force. The mass actually changing the curvature of space and that curvature of space causing the particle to travel in the curve line. That's it. And this subject is called general theory of relativity. Now, you can see that this has curved the space time around it, and this object has no choice but to travel in a curved line, giving us an illusion that the planet is revolving, therefore is accelerating. Yes, but it is not because of force. 
but because of the inherent space-time structure. So Einstein theory was put to test consider solar mass. Paul Einstein's equation to find the path of a planet. And it's unbelievable that Solve Einstein's equation in the mass of find the path in that curvature. It turned out to be an ellipse. This is fascinating. But people asked Einstein that, see, by Newton's law of gravitation, we also we could show that the path of the planets are ellipse, called Kepler's law. The path of the planets are ellipse is we showed from solving Newton's laws, Newton's force law that I wrote earlier. So you are also showing by change from geometric point of view that it is planet. But how do you know that is right? So Einstein said, this is something more. Suppose this is sun, listen to me, this is sun and this is a planet. After one year, the planet moves completely one revolution. And then it, according to Newton theory, it then start again the second year and then the third year and fourth year like this. But according to Einstein, after first one year, this ellipse becomes this, this next one. Then the third year, it becomes this one. So the major axis of the ellipse gradually rotates. Major axis of the ellipse gradually rotates. This is called perihelion precision. So now we have a clear cut, you know, head on to theories. One theory says it is fixed. The other theory says it is rotating. Who is right? So at that time when Einstein was predicting, there was no powerful telescope to show this. But subsequently, it was shown that the angle of rotation for the planet Mercury, you know, one has very small rotation of the that major axis. I showed you that this angle, this axis is rotating. It's a rotating ellipse, rotating ellipse. Small rotation, but when you measured, it exactly agreed with experimental data. So this is an unbelievable success. Describing the perihelion precision of Mercury. And Einstein theory is at the top, absolute top. And Einstein theory then successfully explained many, many phenomena in nature. I don't have time to go there because I will mention only one more before I got talk about gravitational wave. So this also predicted what is called black holes. Black hole essential is a massive star which is created by huge mass and geometry is extremely curved around it. As I said, Einstein showed more is the mass, more is the curvature R. So the massive star collapsed to form a strange condition of space time called black hole. See, this is a, you know, a schematic picture. So when a star collapses to a very dense state, the space time around it become viciously curved that not even light can escape when it comes to a certain distance. It's called a deadly sink. black hole, the light, and viciously, but more close to the star, black hole, the curvature is huge. See, if somehow light can come, come, and it can escape, but if it comes within this distance, this distance is called horizon of the black hole, then it will be sucked in forever. It can never come out, it looks black. It can, it sucks even light. So, you know, recently we have, for the first time, we have photographed M87, Billion times heavier sun, the black hole it has been photographed finally. It's all over the world that from extremely powerful photographic technique. Once again, you can see the fantastic technological innovation to take a photography of black, the black hole. So, and so light can come up to the sea, and the center is a black. So within this, nothing can come out. So evidence of existence of black holes puts Einstein theory on strong footing that gravitational force is a manifestation of space-time geometry. Question is gravitational wave. Now let us go back to my original question. Just as movement of electric charge produces electromagnetic wave, if you remember I showed that electric charge accelerates, it produces electromagnetic wave. Movement of mass also should produce gravitational wave according to Einstein's theory. Why? Einstein showed from this that theory that this is this was the flux. Do you remember f1, f2, f3, f4, 0 means space is flat. So they measured the curvature. Now imagine the mass is here, the curvature is very high at, at a point vicinity, but then the mass moves away, then the curvature falls, then mass comes again, the curvature increases, then mass moves away. So the curvature 
changes, curvature changes as the mass also fluctuates and moves. So these coefficients changes with space and time and Einstein showed that they satisfy this equation which tells you, which reminds you of the same wave equation. C squared, the speed of the fluctuation of the space time, speed of the fluctuation of the space time is the speed of light. It is not infinity as Newton thought. So no relativity is violated, nothing is violated. The space-time fluctuation travels with speed of light as mass moves. Just as a charge moves, electromagnetic wave travels. As the mass moves, I give you a picture. The coefficient that measures the curvature can depend on time, leading to fluctuation and propagation of the space curvature like a wave. Let me show you. See, this curvature, actually, the oscillation, the, the space curvature changes. I will show you even more some interesting picture later that the space curvature moves. Space-time movement of mass causes space-time curvature to fluctuate like the surface of an ocean, which travels like a wave at speed c, gravitational wave. Our space is like the surface of an ocean. Gravitational wave is the wave of this ocean. See, the two masses are coming. So the because of the oscillation, because of their this change of distance, the curvature changes and see the curvature is just imagine a, on the surface of a sheet of a or its cloth it is changing the curvature you know you have you have, a, you have a clothes in the house so this, this curvature oscillates and this curvature of the space time fluctuates and travels with speed of light when two objects they move they sort of electric charge and a mass moves this up so this is the typical picture of a gravitation wave so detection, so all his prediction agreed except the final dream, gravitational wave. Why it is so hard to detect? Unlike electromagnetic wave, it is very difficult to detect this wave since I told you it is very, very weak. Why it is weak? Because of Newton's constant was such a small value that unless the masses are very large, I told you gravitational effect is imperceptible. So for an ordinary mass moving, the gravitational wave that is created has such a small amplitude that just as a small sound you cannot hear, a very small amplitude light you cannot see. Similarly, such a small amplitude wave cannot be detected. And in this case, it is very weak because of the smallness of the Newton's constant, which makes it very weak unless the masses, unless the masses are so large, a gigantic cosmic event is produced by collision of very massive bodies like two black holes merging into a single black hole. So suppose two black holes, this happen in the sky, they come close and they merge into a single black hole, produce huge oscillation in the curvature of the space and time, which travels in the speed of light and moves in the different direction, releasing huge energy in the form of gravitational wave. So see two black holes are gradually coming to form a single black hole. Another picture like this. So as they come close to produce, it emits huge gigantic waves. It's something like earthquakes is happening. Huge waves on the surface of this earth. It's a huge waves on the, our background, space and time. So the two colliding stars or black holes produces this. So to detect, say after 100 years, See, detection was done in 2015 and Einstein the general relativity in 1915. See, it took 100 years when he finally produced an interesting detector. See, the technology innovation. It is called laser interferometer gravitational wave. So it is basically an interferometer which you have studied in your college or university. It's a too long tube. You have seen the interferometers have too long you know, sides, two arms. So it is four kilometer long, very long. And here there is a mirror and the end of the tube, there is another mirror. This is an electromagnetic wave. Laser is an electromagnetic wave. It starts traveling from here to here, goes back, hit the mirror, comes back. And here another, the same laser splits into two parts. Another part travels to this distance, comes back, and they are superposed here. And all of you know, if two light beam, which is part of the same original light, therefore they come back and superposed, 
the superposition will be constructive or destructive depending on the path that they have traveled, the path difference. If it's an integral multiple of wavelength, it's a constructive interference. If it's a half integral multiple of wavelength, it's a destructive interference. All of you have studied Young's double switch experiment. It is absolutely same. So two light rays are coming and they are superposing and they are producing interference pattern. Reflected from two mirrors are superposed to produce interference. Result depends on difference of path traveled by the two rays. Imagine that this, this one wave, this another wave, both the crests are agreeing, so it's a enhancement, it's a constructive interference. In the other case, uh, one crest and another trough, the two opposite phase, they, they are superposing, generating complete destruction, it's called destructive interference. So, you know, in your uh, spectroscopy, in your college days. According to Einstein, the distance traveled by each light ray will depend on the curvature of space. So this is a brilliant idea. See, when light travels this and this, whole idea is that this distance travel depend on the curvature of the space here because this, this is placed in the space. Now, suppose you have kept it here and they have these two light rays gone and they have produced some destructive interference and they completely cancel each other. You, you keep the mirror in such a way. Because of a gravitational wave arrives here, gravitational wave brings in some energy. The moment it brings in energy, it changes the curvature. And interestingly, when it brings in energy, Einstein tells you that mass and energy are equivalent. So that changes the curvature. So a gravitational wave arrives. Curvature, in these two perpendicular direction, in one direction it produces an expansion and another direction produces a compression. So curvature of the geometry changes. As a result, when the path difference was such that there was a destructive interference, the net path difference now will change because of the change of curvature. It changes the length. I'll show you. Because without this curvature, this is the distance. But when it has produced a curvature, then the distance is different. So in the, that tube, that tube, the space has is now curved. So that path traveled by light is also changing because of the curvature. So space-time curvature changes when a gravitational wave arrives there. This result into change of length of path travel by light, as I said, in interferometer, leads to change in interference pattern. What will happen when either it was a complete destructive interference, now you will see that is no longer a destructive interference. There is a slight difference from there, and suddenly there is a fluctuation. But imagine in our say lights accordingly, but here you have to wait for gravitational wave to arrive after collision of that big black holes and anything in the sky, because you cannot create a collision in the sky between two black holes. It is not in your hand. So this is not a lab controlled experiment. We are sitting on the lab, just waiting that a signal of gravitational wave come from sky or not. So as I said, that this is the destructive interference, total black. Is, you can see, but if this little shift of path length of the two tubes, little tip because of the change of curvature, then this will not be exactly opposite phase and there will be slight fluctuation. So this is the exact path, path two paths are such that total destruction, the path have changed, so there's a slight change of phase, and therefore there is a sudden fluctuation. These two superposed is giving you slight fluctuation here in the, this, this row. So there are two such detectors, one is in Hanford and with the Livingstone, two places in the United States, distance by 3,002 kilometers. I will tell you why two and on, on, as I said, on the 14th of September. See, Livingstone suddenly said, these are some small fluctuation, but this is some background noise. But they suddenly saw a huge pump. And then it was detected in Hanford also. The same thing was happening, no signal, no signal, total destruction. Suddenly, you said a fluctuation. Now, why they have kept two things? Because 
if you keep only one then this may happen this change of curvature of the tube of the through which the light is traveling because because of some other local effect maybe some small earthquake maybe some other reason but if it is a gravitational wave it will go through here and here also in both the places and they measured see that beautiful power of experiment they measured the time of detection here and time of detection here they found the difference of time is small a small difference of time so what they did they divided the distance between the two places 3002 km by that time difference and the result they found is the speed of light so they could conclude that actually the gravitational wave arrived here and then it arrived here it took travel with speed of light as predicted by einstein and it has reached from here to here and then it has left the place and universe it has been detected in both the places and for and in total distances the detection confirm that speed of gravitational wave is this which is the speed of light this is an unbelievable experiment and i can tell you just to give an idea do you know the path difference that was measured by this detector this this ligo detector was 1 by 10000 of a size of a proton this is unbelievable this path difference resolution can be measured in an instrument so you can imagine the gravitational physicist the engineers the optical person the spectroscopy it is a confluence of so many different branches of science but we finally detected the gravitational wave traveling exactly at the speed of light as predicted by einstein now then the 3d sky mapping technique so there are some details as to physical technique just found that the energy that you received here of that black hole on various measurement the two black holes of masses the, the wave that we detected here the two black holes of mass 30 solar mass roughly rotating about each other eventually collided the black hole about now you imagine 1.3 billion light years ago 1.3 billion that is 10 to the power 9 years ago the collision took place that is because that collision happened 1.3 billion light years away therefore the gravitational wave which travels with speed of light took this many years to reach us how many event have you ever seen which actually took place 1.3 billion years so we are hearing a mu musical voice of the cosmos but the song was sung 1.3 billion years before resulting gravitational wave reaches us now after 1.3 billion years imagine something happened we have discovered a collision of two black hole in the universe which took place 1.3 billion years ago through a new communication gravitational wave now we have a another communication in our hand you can see this the two collided and gravitational wave emitted and the footprints of cosmic events are resulting the wave that came if you hear the sound i'll try to play it for you because ligo us has released this sound for to hear that's a incredible experience the musical voice of the cosmos so the last 5 minutes i will tell you some interesting things that one of the thing that we are trying that can we now hear the birth cry of our universe by this i mean that we know the galaxy comprises of many many stars as i said the many star in the place of the universe together for to form a galaxy what's it of being many galaxies and it is observed that the distance among galaxies are increasing with time that the universe is expanding expanding away from us and if you go back in time the big bang happened 14 billion years before as i said 14 billion years before the, everything was a point and universe started expanding ever since then because of the big bang and einstein theory gave us a beautiful understanding that if you take the distance between any two galaxies to be some variable a universe consists of many many galaxies if you apply einstein's equation the double prime means the second derivative with respect to time g2a dt square and d is the average density average pressure of the universe the universe 
it turns out that right hand side is down zero the distance among the galaxies distance among the galaxies are changing and it turned out by an experimentalist hubble actually expanding now if you go back in time you will find that at some time t a that is galaxy distance among all galaxies were zero that is whole universe was a point and it started from a huge explosion called big bang for about 14 million years before the universe started that is the beginning this year number may be large but this is not infinite this is a finite number so it started expanding from them and then gradually as i said this is a picture again and energy released at the big bang gave birth to all the masses atoms molecules and life from which the everything is the equation e equal to mc squared i explained this to you earlier that from the energy all masses are created all atoms molecules everything that you see in the universe and therefore we can say that we are all children of big bang the picture that universe started expanding 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 and now we are here and all particles have been created from that huge energy interestingly immediately after the big bang universe went through a huge fast expansion the distance among the galaxies was changing exponentially fast and this is what is called the inflationary stage the universe ex ex expanded with an exponential fast exponentially fast and this called inflation this is this time initial moments universe very rapidly expanded and so i'm sorry and this constant is called hubble constant and such accelerated expansion gives rise to gravitational wave because it, it, it was a huge acceleration of mass and energy studied that the space-time curvature changes and that gravitational wave called primordial gravitational wave that should be there in the whole universe even now of course much diluted smaller amplitude so see that initial inflation generated this wave inflation then gradually expanded all of you can see the various phases but this gravitational wave that was generated now present all everywhere in the universe so can we detect it can we detect this primordial gravitational wave created at the initial epoch to here that was if you call it the birth cry of our universe the moment the big bang took place it is that sound that we want to detect that is our next search I just put the last slide in the way. This is a new way of communication, gravitational wave, our new mode of communication. See, right now, if you ask me that, if we talk in mobile, is it possible that gravitational wave is, of course, the mobile cannot be the size of a black hole that it will emit such a high amplitude wave, which you can detect. So by just oscillating your mobile, you generate gravitational wave, but that will be so low amplitude, nothing can be detected. But all of you know that when science discovers something initially, its applicability is not very obvious. But then we know that when Michael Faraday and you know Benjamin Franklin, these people were discovering electricity, could you imagine your entire life will be dependent on this? So this is our another only possible way of new area of communication from for which we will not need any battery, we will not need anything, no electric charge, is only the mass which generates a new form of gravitational wave. But one thing you have to understand, from a mobile phone, but of course, the gravitational wave spectroscopy already started because we have detected the collision of two black holes in the sky. Earlier, any astrophysical phenomena or cosmological phenomena could be detected by electromagnetic wave. Now we have detected a fantastic phenomena by gravitational wave. So of course, it will someday come in the lab level. In our group, we have done some interesting work about studying the exact nature of gravitational theory from the gravitational wave that has been detected by LIGO US. So we have developed some co collaboration and we are doing many work now with them. And of course, the most important thing is India has finally decided to develop our own LIGO called LIGO India because people realize that, that if different places on the surface of the earth, we need to put the detector because from the same place in the earth, you cannot see the entire sky because, the, you know, if you are in the southern hemisphere, you see the one part, if you are in the northern hemisphere, you see the another part. So we 
it is good to play. so we have another such detector vargo in europe so the detectors are being created and one detector is in india or LIGO india this is now going at, at a very fast rate i talk to them regularly so it is i'm really because it will create huge opportunity of research and many other possibilities and it is in located in maharashtra and we are hoping that we will see here something fantastic my last slide with Einstein, I, I, I'll try to play, if you can, if we know that whether you can hear it, I'll try to play the sound, of course, uh, that sound is the following, mm. I'll try to play the sound, you'll hear one sound first, and the next sound, then, one is Hanford, other is the living stone. Two sounds. Is first you will hear a background, then you will suddenly see the rise in the sound. That is the sound of the gravitational wave. This is again. So let me play it for you again. So, uh, so, so what I'd, I'd like to say that uh, uh, we have, uh, have heard is unbelievable. The sound that you have heard was created 1.7 billion years before. So this is an incredible experience every time I hear it. So let us hope that we are walking towards a fantastic time with new era of communication, absolutely partly with technology and walking hand in hand. And I know that Everybody knows that the coming 50 years will be the time for gravitational wave uh, physics. So, but what we, we, what I started is the final success after 100 years of this man who predicted that see the Newton's law of gravitation is not exactly right. So the new law of gravitation predicts a new mode of communication, namely gravitational wave. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shomi. That was really very interesting and scintillating talk. I'm sure everybody has enjoyed it. Uh, I was, we were trying to see uh, uh, YouTube. We have told people to they can put questions in the YouTube chat box. Okay. So, so how can I hear that? Yeah. So let me see if there are questions. Then I, I think I can read it to you. Is there any question? Yes. 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 Okay, uh, Shupriya would like to ask questions, so let him start with it. Yes, I have actually two questions. This was a fantastic discussion about uh, the gravitational wave. In the context of the Science Day theme, that is the science, technology, and innovation, because this is a marvelous technological innovation, and India is part of it now. India, we are building a detector of such a scale and uh, state of the art technology in india that's a uh, moment of pride actually yeah, so uh, my question is yeah yeah, yeah. Ah. so this is very pertinent to the theme of this year's uh, uh, science day my two question for the first question is you said that uh, the mass uh, so now we know the amplitude of this wave which has been detected Right. And we know that this was uh, created by the collision of two massive 30 times sun, uh, sun's mass is the mass. So right. from this amplitude, can we give a kind of lower limit oh. of what mass, I mean, what, what should be the mass of the body which can create a, a detectable gravitational wave? Okay, okay, I don't, let me see the detectability, of course, will increase with the resolution of our own. So, suppose after 10 years from now, our LIGO kind of detectors comes up with a much stronger resolution. Okay, then what is possible that today we are missing some of the cosmic events, the gravitational wave we are going undetected. That is, see, the gravitational waves are passed through our earth many times in the so many years, but we could detect it in 2015, 
15 because we could finally achieve that resolution detector which could detect that. So in coming years, I believe that we will be able to detect more and more small amplitude gravitational waves and more our efficiency of our detector will increase. We should be able to detect everything and that is our goal. Our goal is to detect very small amplitude as small as possible because so many gravitational waves are traveling but most are very small amplitude because it is generated from small masses. But if someday we can create a digital resolution, that will be excellent. So that is our goal. Yeah, and I think my next question is somehow related to this, uh, that you said that the, uh, at the beginning, uh, at the time of the Big Bang, a huge uh, gravitational wave uh, was created and a part of it uh, um, in a much smaller scale would still be available everywhere. But now with the time, that is this 14 billion years, so do we have to wait for this for some more time or we have to lower down or, or I mean make our measurements better to hear about what yes. price? Yes. We have to make our measurement better and we are actually trying to make our measurement better. Uh, but you know that the this wave is, is now such a small amplitude. I mean, so see, I mean, what is the, I mean, if we detect first what it will vindicate, it will vindicate first that the inflationary model of the universe, that at the time of Big Bang, there was a huge inflation, but that's a model, right? So that model will be supported if we can detect this. So when this was first, I mean, we thought that we are in the process of detection, entire community of inflationary physicists, they were very excited. They thought that it will be a kind of huge thing for them. But <clears throat> unfortunately, so far we have not been able to detect this gravitation, uh, primordial gravitational wave. And uh, we just, we are waiting just as cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, in the background, with three degree Kelvin temperature detection established Big Bang. Similarly, the detection of primordial gravitational wave, that was electromagnetic wave, the, the gravitational wave detection will establish inflation, a model of the universe. So, uh, so whether, so suppose if we find that the inflationary model is wrong, then there will be no primordial gravitational wave because at that time the inflation has not taken place. But it is a kind of, it is being searched to support a theory, whether the theory is right or wrong. Because the inflationary model has very strong points. Thank you, sir. Okay, so since there are no more questions, so thank you, Shomitra, once more. It was really interesting and it was really good for all of us. I really enjoyed your talk. So thank you once more. Thank you. I also, for Bosch Institute, you have seen the uh, role of Professor Sir Jesse Bosch. Yes, that's right. What role to play? And I mean, we actually, I, I, I feel very sad that when you see that we are so callous and you see in Bengal, how many people really do care about such a discovery that took place here? I mean, we are so casual about it. I mean, see, <coughs> meet anybody in any other profession. Yes. And ask yeah. that, do you know that Jesse Bosch did this in this city? I mean, yes, I know that I, I have talked to many people. Nobody understand the implication of this work. This is such an unbelievable detection. Yeah, yeah. Onash is on all of us, right? I mean, we... All of us. Yeah, all of us. Absolutely. So, I don't know. Maybe we should start uh, We should start rethinking about it, how to do it in a collective way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so Jesse Bosch's actual experiment, that discovery, its mm. history, its background, what actually happened at that time, I don't know, maybe in your institute you have, may have some documents on this. I really don't know. <coughs> so if you can find it out, that will be excellent. We have some of the models, uh, not many, but a uh, few instruments. We have been able to uh, make a model of that. So we have that in our museum. But as you said uh, correctly, that to let the people know in a much more wider way is has not been yeah. done really. And... Uh, Maybe we should, as a collective way, I mean, the whole, it's not that's the Bose Institute, it is the job of the, perhaps the whole West Bengal fraternity to do this thing I'm talking together. About, I'm talking about the scientific community. I'm not talking yeah, about the right. It is the entire scientific community of not only in Bengal, the whole India, I think. I mean, yes, but as I said, yeah. as, as I said, it's 
charity begins at home so we may should, we should start from our end first and then see how much we can go for it yeah i'll be very happy to do that i'll be very happy to thank you we, we are actually in a way of thinking how to do it so i'm sure i will contact you or uh, our director will contact you whenever needed no, for no, that thing no, okay. okay so thanks once more thank you thank you thank you for the invitation okay thank you Okay. Mr. Shengupta, thank you so much for um, taking time out from your very busy schedule. I know you have a lot of responsibilities at work, and so I just try to, I just try to uh, keep this level so that unnecessary technical details I just left out so that for a general larger audience, I kept out all the mathematics, everything, all the details. So I so that. The whole spirit of the thing is clear. Absolutely. You explained the ex excitement about this very adequately. Yeah. I was I, I was just amazed. I, I mean, we've read Thank about you. it in newspapers, but you made it uh, sort of come alive for us. Right? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you sincerely. Thank you. We, we look forward to hosting you again. Oh, sure. Maybe some other time. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the invitation again. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we'll now move on to the second leg of this program. After this uh, wonderful webinar, we invite the scholars forums, uh, especially Bapti, who will now take over from me for the next leg of the program, which is a debate. Bapti, I hope you are connected. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Sonal. Bhakti uh, is a bit unavailable over the video right now. So, um, firstly, we would like to thank Dr. Shomitra Sengupta for a wonderful talk. And uh, good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to the debate session organized by the scholars of Bose Institute. Uh, as we all know, National Science Day is celebrated on this very day, 28th February, in India, each year to mark the discovery of the Raman effect by none other, none other than Sir C. V. Raman, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1930. Without further delay, we would be moving to our debate sessions. As we all know, in the current scenario of the pandemic, where health information and health awareness has been the utmost priority for everyone, uh, it would have been the best to choose the topic uh, for today's discussion. Health websites are a reliable source of information. We have four volunteers who have come forward to participate in the discussion and uh, of which two would be talking for the motion and two would be going against the motion. I call upon uh, our forum, Mr. Gaurav Das from the Department or Division of Bioinformatics to start this debate in uh, favor of this motion. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Gaurav Das. Uh, I have if you could uh, turn on your video. Okay, okay, okay. I think am I audible and visible? Yes, please. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm Gaurav Dash. I have recently enrolled under the supervision of Dr. Jumur Ghosh in Division of Bioinformatics. Now in this debate competition, I would like to talk in the favor of the motion. That is the healthcare, web, uh, healthcare websites indeed contain reliable source of information. Basically, I would like to speak on two perspectives. One is the perspective of the researcher, another is the perspective of the common people or general person. Now, if we consider the researcher, I really feel that the researcher are quite blessed and fortunate enough to do researches in this age. The age which is the age of the big data, age of the data science, age of the artificial intelligence, where every day plenty of data has been uploaded in various healthcare websites and other websites. So it gives the opportunity to the researcher to make various kind of data mining and data analysis to get their solution. But previously it was not possible when someone stuck in their researches, if they cannot get any kind of solution and it got delayed, but which is not the case in current scenario. 
Number two point is that it has been uh, in the COVID pandemic situation in lockdown, the importance of those healthcare websites has become more prominent. Though people were completely stuck within the uh, within home, but it has been but the researches hasn't been stopped because in the in the meantime it has been found that the plenty of groundbreaking researches has happened. One of them is that the very year old problem of protein structure prediction that is the cast competition critical uh, uh, critical screening of uh, structural protein prediction. Now, London-based Google team DeepMind actually created AlphaFold 2, which actually provided the state-of-the-art solution. And now, they have specified that in spite of getting home, they have provided that solution because they have got plenty of reliable resources in the website and, in fact, healthcare-based website. And, in fact, in the COVID situation, we have found that within that one year of the SARS-CoV-2 virus inter introduction, plenty of paper has been published. Not only that, within six months, the vaccine has been rolled out and they have succeeded. Why? Because the information which has been uploaded in the healthcare websites are reliable enough. Now let's move back to the common people scenario. In the recent scenario, it has been found a very dangerous trend that when there exists some health issue, what common people do? They actually search the internet to get the drugs without consulting clinical physician. But the yes, that's true that the healthcare website contain drug information, but not the side effect of drug. So I believe if common people or general public actually follow some basic guideline regarding the healthcare based system, then we can remove those cards regarding that the non reliability. What are those? First of all, they should not follow any .net or .com domain based website for healthcare information, because it contain non reliable, non reputable and biased information. Number two, they should always follow government or intergovernmental based website like the website of who website of NCBI, NIH, that is the website of .gov domain. Number three, they should always follow the website of the hospital organization, research institute, that is the .edu domain, because this contain all the information which are practically reviewed. So what I believe is that the, God, uh, there is a, exist another problem for the common people that the searching data within this website is not quite easy. So they search in the Google search engine and they got a lot of information. But yet the Google search engine is not suggested for healthcare based information. That's why US government actually proposed a search engine which name as medlineplus.gov. It is the search engine for that healthcare based information. So I would like to conclude by saying that the uh, researchers are quite blessed enough because their life has been made easy by the healthcare websites, but the common people should follow some basic guidelines to remove the curse evolving around the non-reliability of the healthcare website. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gorobas. Uh, yeah, as you have pointed out, um, during the pandemic, information available on the internet did help some of us and also the vaccine was made in when we had that information at hand in at our doorstep as in everybody had the computers at their home to log on to and get information but uh, to counter this or talk against the motion we have Shazia Firdos from uh, the division of bioinformatics and she would uh, you know enlighten why the healthcare websites could not uh, prove much to be a source of information uh, Shazia I would like you to start thank you Good, after, good evening, everyone. I'm Shazza Firdos from Division of Bioinformatics, pursuing my PhD under the guidance of Dr. Sudipto Saham. Um, uh, so I'm here to express my views against the motion on the topic of health websites are reliable source of information. I personally did not agree with this statement. Yes, there are sites which provide reliable information but along with some drawbacks and that too very few medical websites are there 
um there is bunch of drawbacks on following these websites and here i will discuss only few of them and the points that needed to be considered before following uh, these health websites uh, the first one is lack of evidence as we know medical practice is a complex science and also subject of experience and further diagnosis is more than a collection of symptoms and also the sites do not have reputable medical research to back up their claims therefore it would be unwise to seek medication from a website which cannot even provide prescription for the drug the second is the information on the sites were not up to date for example covid 19 was first reported weeks after it was detected in china in january 2020 the symptoms were conveyed to be of respiratory origin however in june 2020 it was reported that the virus could cause gastrointestinal disorder too and this update was finally published in the month of september 2020 the next is funding and purpose of the websites are major concern as these factors influence their content if the site is funded by a company it will only recommend its own product this should be taken into consideration the last is is your privacy protected privacy protection is also a major concern when dealing with health websites thereby health information should be confidential so be uh, be aware of the website that ask for private information or share your details with other without your permission hereby i rest my case thank you uh thank you shazia for uh, pointing us out the uh, you know the merits of having information at our doorstep or at our hand um here we would be inviting debadrita basu from division of bioinformatics to lay down her views on this topic hello everyone am i audible yes debadrita you are audible okay hello and good afternoon to everyone the topic of today's talk, you know, debate is healthcare websites are reliable sources of information today i am going to talk in favor of the motion statistics have shown that about 60% adults in usa at this moment is looking up for something in in their phone and it is third most common for people looking up for something on the internet is to look up for health informations internet is easily accessible highly affordable and so it is more co most common for patients to already search for uh, their symptoms before even consulting the physicians i know there are a down, uh, there are some downsides of these but uh, doctors say that if the patient search wisely they can get a decent knowledge uh, about the background of their illness or disorders so uh, where to search from uh, in the websites so i think uh, gorabda has already said about that so um, you should always search for governmental aided websites and uh, websites maintained by uh, professionals like medical professionals or scientists groups and uh, the references where the referencing is properly done and uh, it should be updated regularly uh, you can uh, see that if the uh, website is updated regularly or not and um, you have to find out uh, who actually is publishing the data that is if it is a medicine company then it may promote its own um, drugs but if it is um, especially the government aided uh, websites then it will uh, provide you the correct information during the past uh, i can't say past still but uh, during the pandemic situations also the number of patients outnumbered the number of health professionals by thousands of folds and so it was not possible for everyone to consult um, a doctor or a physician uh, on a one to one basis so uh, here you can actually uh, get some knowledge you can apply some precautions uh, before you get to actually talk to a real doctor you must not uh, 
follow the websites which are personal blogs or uh, online forums or chat rooms where the uh, where the opinions may be someone's personal opinion so um i think people uh, will say many things against the motion but uh, i think everything every uh, techniques has some uh, limitations to them so only focusing on on them uh, will not do yes uh, they have to improve but there are certain sites which are really reliable especially i said that the government aided sites like mayo the mayo clinic and uh, cancer.org etc so uh, you can um, you have to a little wise uh, while surfing through the websites and uh, it will save a lot of effort for uh, medical professionals at times if if it is not a very uh, big uh, type of a disease or disorder and um, sometimes medical professionals even can look into uh, how the data is are managed like how how it is been in other parts of the countries or other countries as well so uh, we can't actually go against a like uh, a great effort like this and uh, where the medicinal professionals and the data scientists come together in hand, hand in hand to develop a health web healthcare website so hoping uh, for improvement but uh, i should say i would say that it's still a reliable source of information at least for the government ones thank you thank you dibadita as you and gorobda have uh, rightly highlighted the benefits in the favor of the motion i uh, would i we still have ruby uh, ruby biswas from the division of plant biology who could uh, give you certain insights to how this uh, topic the health uh, websites that are a reliable source of information could not always be the same uh, ruby could you please enlighten us uh, yes thank you sonal um good evening everyone i am ruby biswas and today i stand here with a firm conviction against the motion that health websites are a reliable source of information the current era of internet is based on web 2.0 the idea that in content could be generated by users this implies that anyone can create content so there is no gatekeeper or safeguards to make sure that the information available online is reliable anonymity is the in the authorship of the information is a major concern it enables dissemination of information and verification of its accuracy and authenticity which is often relegated to the background if not like ignored outright when searching for health related information from online sources several matters of concern arise out of which i would like to mention some of the most critical ones as mentioned earlier anonymity in the content authors is a pertinent concern Although many organizations make sure that the information on the website is accurate, anonymity ensures the presence of trolls or imposters who would exploit the public trust in these websites in order to further their own agenda on the internet, whether to peddle their own false information or to goad users into buying fake and ineffective products or to make them download malware. Most information available on the internet is in the form of web pages or blogs. These websites do not have an editorial board to review the information or be accountable in case of false and misleading information. Blogs are by definition spaces for expression of personal opinion, and information found on them is bound to be affected by personal biases on the of the authors. There is no way to safeguard such information against common statistical errors such as sampling biases or cherry picking. Most of the revenues of the websites are derived from advertisements and endorsed sales. In both cases, the purpose and wording of the information is intended to coax the reader to buy the endorsed products and services. These websites also play a host to notorious trackers from advertising companies whose sole purpose is to get users to interact with as many as advertisements possible. This culture serves to actively undermine the accuracy and authenticity of the information in favor of boosting sales. as example i should give you like uh, you know two widespread myths that have persisted on multiple online forums and can be found on many health blogs and website vaccines cause autism this has been debunked many times since 1998 but the myth still persists online vitamin supplements always make one healthier 
A study published in 2016 showed that some older women who take calcium supplements may face an increased risk of dementia. Another 20-year-old research published in 2015 linked an unprescribed vitamin supplement to an increased risk of cancer. Another most recent example is that of Patanjali Ayurved's drug Coronil. Coronil was initially marketed in June 2020 to as a research-backed Ayurvedic drug that could cure COVID-19. No evidence was presented by the company at that time to back their claims. According to the application to be certified by the relevant ministry, it was found that Coronil was termed as an immunity booster and not a cure. As a consequence, the Ministry of Ayush has halted sales and advertisement for the drugs. It was, however, st still sold as an immunity booster in Patanjali stores. In February 2021, the company claimed to have obtained certification from WHO for Coronil, and it launched and uh, launched it in the presence of union ministers, including the uh, Minister of Health. According to Patanjali's spokesperson, the drug has done a business of over 500 crore in the country since August 2019. The WHO later clarified that it had neither reviewed nor certified the effectiveness of any traditional medicine for the treatment of COVID-19. Like now, I would like to move on to the concluding part of my like uh, uh, motion of uh, like for the stand is that health websites are often a simple collection of like information with no claims about the correctness, authenticity, or objectivity of the information. As access to health research and evidence is increases so do the risk of misunderstanding it and the chances of an unqualified person getting the complete and balanced picture decrease. Thus, health websites and blogs are unreliable source of information which may be harmful at the best, but can, positively and can, but can be positively dangerous and life-threatening in worst cases. A medical professional with proper training and accountability cannot be substituted by an unverified opinion of an anonymous author. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Um, as from our discussion by all the four members, we uh, can ha we probably can come to a you know small uh, conclusion like uh, educating ourselves uh, about our health issues or medica medical conditions is definitely an important and vital part of managing our own health. For which we could definitely look up to the internet and uh, authenticated sites where we would get. Uh, sufficient information to at least give us a lead or uh, uh, you know to start um, or, or, or no, not start to have an opinion of what could be wrong with me but uh, no information should replace seeing a doctor who can who is the only one rather who can give you the advice to cater to your specific situation um, because after all as we all know a little learning is a dangerous thing so with this, I would uh, request Dr. Supriyo Das to conclude our sessions and uh, thank Bapti Ghosh and Froi Das along with all the participants of today's program to you know make an effort on the online platform, which is uh, this kind of event is the first of its kind from the BIRSF. Thank you, Sona. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, we've come to the end of today's program. Uh, before closing, I would like to extend my sincere thank you to some uh, uh, to some members of the Bose Institute community. Um, but before doing that, I would like to again formally thank Professor Shomitro Shengupto from IACS for graciously accepting our invitation and coming and giving us such a wonderful glimpse into the LIGO project and making it accessible to all of us. Um, we look forward to hosting him again and hopefully this time in person. I would also like to thank our director, Professor Udoy Bantopadhai. Although he could not be here with us today, he has provided support and encouragement for this program all throughout. So a big thank you to Professor Bantopadhai. Another heartfelt thank you to Professor Shupriyo uh, Das, who has organized this event. He has put in relentless effort from making the poster to popularizing the event. So again, thank you, Shupriyo. Thanks are also due to staff member, uh, Mr. Arjun Das for his technical support. And again, a lot of effort that Arjun has put in and also Ms. Jani Chakraborty for her help with Facebook. And last but not the least, I would like to thank the members of the Bose Institute Research Scholars Forum, especially uh, the members who spoke 
and also Throy, um, I, I think it was uh, Throy, Sonal, and Bapti. Uh, the they have come up and uh, arranged everything within a very short notice, and actually have put up a program which was very informative, giving us a caution as well as encouraging us to find or making us aware of the pitfalls of finding information in the net that may not be absolutely true. So thank you all and look forward to hosting the new, uh, the next National Science Day a year from now. Thank you and see you next time. Bye-bye.